Okay, so good afternoon to, uh, to everybody. Thank you again for attending the seminar on public diplomacy. I would like to start by again thanking the diplomatic schools, thanking Del Instituto Elcano, thanking all our guests and uh, experts, professionals, friends coming from all over the, the world and also of course those who are following us not only here the public but also uh, via streaming via the the web page of real instituto Elcano uh, all around the world so again thank you again and welcome to this uh, to this third and last session it's uh, the third panel <coughs> it would deal about uh, one of the dimensions of public diplomacy we saw this morning it's uh, public diplomacy in international organizations. You will see and observe that uh, this panel and this debate comes in a very timely moment. We just had the NATO summit in Wales only some days ago. Today, the new European Commission has been announced. Now, <laughs> the ambassador will, will tell us a little bit more about it. And of course, we have a new high representative and vice president of of the Commission. So it is uh, an excellent panel and thank you uh, all again for your presence and your contributions. Um, only some first words of introduction about the different panelists. We, I think uh, we won't be able to have better panelists in this panel because we have three excellent friends and professionals uh, talking to us and also establishing this dialogue, which is also one of the ideas of this seminar with all of you uh, here today. First of all, let me start by Ambassador Francisco Fonseca, an incredible expert in EU matters. He's now currently the head of the European Commission office in Spain. He's a lawyer, he has masters in law and PhD in EU law. He uh, used to be director at the European Commission and also director of cabinet of the Justice and Home Affairs Commissioner. But he was also, and that's interesting, and it, it will be interesting for you uh, for the question and answer session, he was also part of the team, of the negotiation team of both the Maastricht and the Amsterdam Treaty, so that's uh, very interesting. But also, I would like to add on a personal note that he's not only a friend, a very good professional, but a very active uh, professional uh, and person in uh, what we call blogs and Twitter, and he has changed, I've seen it, uh, the web page of the yes, <laughs> and, uh, and the web page of the European Commission. So. Uh, He's uh, uh, an excellent professional. Thank you again for, for coming. Maria, Maria Kokonen, a uh, very good friend, uh, an excellent professional. I was very lucky, so lucky to work with her when I used to work at the, at the EIS in Brussels. He's now currently the deputy head of the strategic communication division, but uh, she has a long experience in the area of communication. She used to be the spokeswoman for Connie Hedegaard, the Commissioner for Climate Action. He was the head press service of the European Commission representation office in Paris. He ha uh, she has also a broad experience in the private sector. You will see Maria is wonderful. And of course, Stephen, uh, or Steve Meringer, he is currently the head of the communication services in the NATO public division, uh, public diplomacy division but he has a broad experience, a broad diplomatic experience, and a very interesting one, I, I should add, and underline. He served in Iraq more than three years uh, with the US Department of, of uh, State, and he was the director of the broadcast operations at the US Embassy in Baghdad. He was uh, selected, I've seen, for the Department of State Meritorious Honor Award, so he has a very good uh, uh, experience in, in this field and he also worked, that's interesting as well for us to know, more than 15 years he was broadcasting news, uh, he was a journalist and producer for NBC, ABC and Fox, so uh, uh, quite astonishing as well curricula for the three panelists here present with, with us today. Um, let me only add some, some ideas that have been uh, initiated in 
in the first uh, panels. And let me present me briefly. I'm Ricardo Diez Hochleiner, the Deputy Director of Public Diplomacy in our uh, Ministry of Foreign Affairs. It's a rather young unit, a rather small one, but we try to be as active as, as we can. And uh, let me only highlight two ideas <coughs> that were mentioned this, this morning. No, the French ambassador, I think, uh, said quite correctly that there is a debate between secret and, and public diplomacy. Uh, this is one of the areas we can talk about uh, later. But let me just underline um, the structure, how we work in, in the Ministry of Foreign Affairs in these areas. As I said, it's, it, it is a quite young unit. We work very closely with another Directorate General, which is the OED. It's the Diplomatic Information Office. Cecilia Juste, the Director General, spoke to us this morning. And we are twin director generals. Ours is called Medios y Diplomacia Pública, so communication, if you want, and public diplomacy, and we work very closely together. As you have seen, the other director general has to do with the spokesperson traditional role. We have more to do with the ministers, press and communication uh, matters, and also with public diplomacy. We are starting, therefore, only a couple of years ago, working with a myriad of institutions. Uh, one of the most important projects, of course, as you have seen today, is the Brand Spain initiative. Uh, it is a very relevant in terms of our government, in terms of the priority that our minister is paying to that initiative. But we also work with many other institutions in Spain. As you know, there are several models and there are uh, much better academic representatives here uh, and more experienced than myself, but uh, there are many different models of public diplomacy. Ours, we, we can say that it is a decentralized model. Uh, there is the Spanish Ministry of Foreign Affairs, but we have uh, a number of institutions with large tradition and with many important assets as regards public diplomacy. I can think about Instituto Cervantes, I can think about the Carolina Foundation uh, related with exchange programs, I can think about our agency of cooperation, I, think I can think about think tanks we cooperate very closely with, uh, like Elcano, I can think about a number of institutions. Within this, uh, these uh, different institutions, I want to highlight uh, two or three, uh, for example, the what we call in Spain houses of public diplomacy. This is something very different. We had a visit of President Barroso only some months ago, and we were with our minister, with García Margallo, and we visited Casa Mediterránea. It's one of the six houses of public diplomacy uh, located, in this case, in Alicante. And our minister showed uh, President Barroso how this system works, and he was quite astonished because it is a mixture between three different levels of government, the central government through our Ministry of Foreign Affairs, regional government through, uh, in this case, the government of Valencia, of the Valencia region, and finally, the local government through, in this case, the city of Alicante and others joining the project. But we also have Casa America in Madrid, we have Casa Arabe, we have Centro Sefara de Israel, we have uh, the House of Africa, we just had in New York two days ago a seminar on tourism and investment in Africa, also with the collaboration of the Real Instituto Elcano. So it is a quite astonishing model and the president took note of, of this system. We have also the foundations uh, between different countries, as, as Spain, and the US, uh, Charles Powell this morning was referring to an activity, a very relevant one, only some days ago. And of course, uh, again, the, the tradition of the Instituto Cervantes related not only to language or languages in Spain, but also related to culture. So only this, uh, the first, these first introductory words uh, to welcome again the panelists to tell you a little bit about our model and of course I'm more than happy to answer questions and now I will ask our, um, our panelists to say maybe in five, seven minutes about the experience of uh, public diplomacy in the different organizations and, uh, and also a little bit about their personal experience uh, in, the, in the last years. So thank you again and, and maybe Ambassador Fonseca if you can if you can start, and and then Maria, and uh, and Steve. Okay, thank you very much, and thank you to to the Spanish Escola Diplomatica and Elcano for organizing this uh, this debate. Uh, I was this morning only at the end, but I was uh, I had the feeling 
of what important these kind of discussions are. So, uh, dear friends, I have I have a problem uh, to talk about policy diplomacy in this context because uh, I am not uh, in the external action service. I am from the representation of the European Union into the states. Thanks, Ricardo, but I am not a diplomat. I am only a civil a civil servant. So I decide uh, just to to understand uh, what are you waiting or what are you waiting to hear for me. I understand to begin with uh, uh, my my start, starting point would be the the classical definition of public diplomacy. You know, it's the classical definition of the system made by the by the former dean of the Tufts uh, sorry Tufts Fletcher School in the United States. Public diplomacy, I understand, is a communication with foreign public to establish a dialogue aimed to inform to inform and to have and to win influence. So my idea was to, uh, is uh, consequently to talk about uh, that. How I see my role trying to, to address to, well, I am Spanish, but in my, my functions at, at the representative of the European Commission to a foreign public, uh, trying to inform and to, to have a kind of influence. And uh, concerning the use legationis and the exercise of the diplomatic function, I am sure that Maria will, t will talk on you on that, uh, that is not my problem. You know, the European External Action Service is a very powerful machinery with more uh, 139 delegations, I think. So, but uh, by the way, uh, you know uh, that uh, the first delegation of the, the European communities is 60 years old. The first delegation of the European Union in the external world was established in 54 in Washington. And you know why I have a here a statement very curious? Because the president of the European Coal and Steel Community, Jan Moneda, was concerned, I am quoting, was concerned that the United States might interpret the demise of proposals for European defense community as a message that efforts of, of inter, sorry, at integration were losing steam and he does needed to send a positive sign to State Secretary Asian. And we established the first delegation in this kind of pre-public diplomacy approach in 54 in Washington. So, that you are not very original because at the same time in 54 uh, we open also the first uh, representation at the time was Office of Information of the European uh, High Authority. We were in the time of the current state community in Bonn, in Bonn in 54. And why we open in Bonn in 54, just before the European communities? Because Jan Monet was aware that it was impossible to communicate and to have an influence if the only capacity to communicate was to have contacts with correspondent of the European newspapers in Luxembourg. So and they decided to create in 54, first in Bonn and after that in, pa in Rome and in Paris, offices in order to have direct contacts with journalists, with, with, with media in the capitals because it was the only possibility to dialogue, to learn more, and to have an influence. So, I call that the, the, the prehistory of the pre-diplomacy, but I found that interesting. But of course, I am not here to, to, to talk on the history, but to talk on, on how I see my role on the, on the public diplomacy. Well, you know, I am, uh, my title is the Director of the Representation of the European Commission in Spain. We are not in the national services. Our legal basis is another legal basis. We, our legal basis is Article 335 on the Treaty of the European of the Functioning. And the idea is to ensure that 
the legal personality that each member state is obliged to give to the European Commission in the states is due representing. That is why we are establishing the capitals to be a kind of uh, interlocutors with the administrations, to be the, 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 the postal service for the communication between citizens and the commission, and to be, in another dimension, the eyes and the ears of Moscow, in brackets, please. So, how, how I see my role in this tenure of diplomacy? We have, in the representations, we have uh, three words that, in my opinion, sum up perfectly what is our role. We are there, I am here in Madrid, for listening, advising, and engaging. And that is absolutely clear and transparent in uh, my mandate. My mandate, of course, began to be uh, a good, uh, and Maria knows, because my Maria used to work on the representation in Paris, our role is to organize, of course, the visit of the president of the commission, of commissioners, to help the visit of the high representative, etc., etc., uh, to be sure that uh, the, they are received at the appropriate level, to be sure that uh, they have the maximum of publicity, to ensure the follow-up, etc., etc., that is a role of protocol, if you want. But this, for me, a, has a certain relevance in terms of public diplomacy. Why? Because when a commissioner, and you know I have 28 commissioners, to establish a real good program for uh, each of the 28 is a, it requires a kind of imagination, I take advantage of the, these official visits just to, to have a contact of commissioners with the Spanish reality. Examples. Well, for example, the Commissioner of Employment, Commissioner Andor. He is now fascinated and he is a good preacher in Europe, Commissioner Andor, about the, the role and the task of ONCE, the Spanish organization. The capacity to create a real, in brackets, multinational in the world of this capacity. And to have this personal contact, to, to come back to Brussels with the flair of a very important uh, economic uh, economic uh, firm in Spain, like the ONCE, is important. Or when uh, a commissioner like Commissioner Tajani is able to discuss directly with the big box of the Spanish uh, Business uh, Confederation to discuss on the problems on tourists and the low cost planes, that gives the flavor of the capacity for European Commission to engage a, di a dialogue and to have influence, because this message to have you, the trade unions, you, the media, you, the business uh, people, social sectors, my door is open in Brussels, that is very important in terms to, to enhance the role of the European Union into the member states. I insist, we are, we are at home, we are not outside, we are not abroad. abroad. The second part of my mandate, of course, is to, to represent the Commission. To present the Commission, that means that we need to be the interface uh, with the member states, with national, with regional, with regional, with local authorities. Just an example. You know that in the terms of economic governance, we are in this exercise, exercise called European Semester. European Semester means that when uh, uh, the Spanish government or the or the Hungarian and any government presented that of budget, before the, the national parliament begins to, to study that, uh, the commission gives recommendations. So, in Spain, we have, of course, the national budget. The national budget is, in real, li in real life, 90% is the same for national government and for communities because the autonomous, the fiscal autonomy is uh, thin, but what's happened, for example, in Navarra and El País Vasco. So, we are engaged. We are engaged. We begin, of course, with the Spanish Parliament, but we are going to the all regional parliaments, explaining, discussing, listening there, 
αν τράγει το regional parliament, ο τρόμο parliament, understand what is the reality of the economic governance. And for me, that is a real input because we are committing people to be on the rule of the law, also in big brackets. Third uh, mandate or third uh, objective I have, political information and analysis. We, we try to be, I have one of my colleagues here, to be the eyes and the ears of Moscow, in brackets, just being able to explain in Brussels uh, the real situation in economic, political and social life in Spain. Well, I am not going to talk about Catalonia, but there is a certain uh, interest uh, that uh, uh, people in Madrid, uh, we have a kind of privileged channel to establish communication between Spanish authorities, European authorities, and to explain European authorities what is the real problem. Do you imagine that for a commissioner, we are talking, I, if I understand, more or less in the Chetan has rule, but a commissioner coming from, from Finland, the different, the, is there a difference between Scotland and Catalonia? For me, not so easy. So we need to have this, to establish this qualitative analysis, and we'll try to do. Four uh, objective is press, press and media communications. Of course, everybody knows me, Miguel is my head of press here, in El País, in El Mundo, in El Cano, everybody knows, knows, knows us. But in Spain, the regional media are at least so important than national one. So we are in a permanent, in a permanent op command operation going to the regions, going to Bocento, to Prensa Ibérica, to the different regional media, just in order to discuss, or using my slogan, to listen, advising, and engaging people. And I can't assure you that when I write an article in uh, El Correo or in La Voz de Galicia, though I am able to write all the week, if, if, if I want, to. to write an article in El País del Mundo means a kind of different protocol. So that is very important to have in the whole Spanish territory a press as a communication of Europe. And last but not least, in my last word, we have a very important task of how to reach the citizens. So we are a kind of uh, pro bono lawyer for many, many, many people in Spain. Uh, example, I don't know if you said in English, the, the las preferentes, the share, the share bonds, the share. Well, there is more or less 20,000 people that have presented a, a claim against the banks in Spain. Almost the half of these complaints have been presented on an individual basis in our office in order to be submitted to Brussels for a possible procedure. So what that means? That means that you are visible for citizens in Spain, for the good or for the bad things, that uh, obliges you to have a real commitment for people, to have the possibility to open your doors, open your doors to all the uh, Spanish citizens. Uh, well, I'm talking of think tanks. Uh, we are uh, very good clients. Charles, but not only that, I'm talking about citizens. I, I could talk to you about the absolutely incredible examples. For example, I was obliged in, my, in, in the office to receive a delegation of European citizens, not Spaniards, participating in the gay parade in Madrid because they trust, my, they trust more in me than in the national embassies for small problems like bribery or something like that. I have, I have people in the building coming from the, from the, from the, the, the from the, do you say, uh, uh, in English, what do you say that? Uh, people with, with, the, with, they are completely, ah, uh, completely in a, in a chair wheel. 
because paraplegic, paraplegic. Compre from the from the neck to the back. And this guy uh, represent this day one day the, the one representation of the Spanish Association entry my offices and say, Well, we you stay here all the weekend until the moment that President Barroso doesn't come here to talk with us, we stay here. And what do you do? You call the police? So you listen, advising and engaging. So that is a kind of a kind of summary of how I understand my role of public diplomacy in Spain and uh, thank you very much. Thank you so much for, for your words and uh, Maria, the, the floor is yours. Thank you. Ricardo, let me, let, uh, let me start by saying how happy I am to be here this afternoon with you. Uh, actually, um, I was discussing with the rapporteur, who will have the, the, the honor to wrap up the discussions this afternoon, which task is uh, more different, to be the last speaker or the, the, the person who sums up. Now you took it away from me, so I'm completely relieved I'm not the last speaker. That will be Stephen afterwards. But I'm not um, unfamiliar to be in the last sessions of events, because when we at the External Action Service organize pre-posting seminars, I'm very often put in the last session to wake people up. So, see, people are already looking up. So, thank you again for the invitation. Actually, I wanted to tweet already uh, earlier today about EEAS participating in a workshop here at Escuela uh, Diplomatica, but we put that on hold because uh, our Twitters, our social media team is now um, engaged and busy with the announcements uh, and uh, the new commission. So, it's a historical day today. So also a landmark day for us. So when I got the invitation to come and speak here, I had the choice to, to ch uh, between uh, telling you how we engaged, uh, engaged um, in public diplomacy in the field or in the headquarters. Now we took very much away already in the earlier discussions today how uh, member states' embassies do public diplomacy in the field, but I would very much um, I like to emphasize how much I like thinking that the European External Action Service's public diplomacy approach is based on two legs, cultural diplomacy and digital diplomacy. Cultural diplomacy is, are those events, it's made of those events that our 139 delegations do to engage with uh, the uh, publics recipients, target groups in the host countries. And by the way, there was one word missing on, uh, of that uh, public diplomacy definition you used. There's a multitude of these definitions. The word influencing was missing there. Because we can choose the definitions we use. But I like to choose influencing because it is about changing the perception of a third country audience over a given country or an organization. So how does the European External Action Service engage on global issues as a global uh, organization in the sense that we are, we are covering to, to the world uh, with our delegations? So cultural diplomacy to the delegations and at the headquarters, and that is my choice today. In particular, we engage, we are active uh, on social media. We, true, we do public diplomacy through uh, social media. It was said several times today already how social media has changed diplomacy and international relations. We use two landmark events to, to demonstrate this. You have all present in your minds the Arab Spring and the Euromaidan uh, protest. They, how they demonstrated the social media, its impact on public opinion and international relations. Hierarchies gave way or to networks, and communication became, has become more people to people. It's not top down, but it's more people to people. It was uh, said earlier today. So the media landscape has changed dramatically, and social media, in fact, in our opinion, has become the major source for, of news for many people, for most of, for most of our target audiences. So. What are the key elements, the key principles of, of efficiently using the social media? 
for public diplomacy. You have to be timely. You have to be accurate. You have to be credible. And you have to be interactive. So with, this, uh, with these principles, you can maximize the use of social media for public diplomacy. But obviously, that requires also a clear internal, internal communication, staff resources, and training. And that's what we do with our delegations. When we have pre-posting seminars for our ambassadors, for the staff in our delegations, the EU delegations, when we have, like we had ten day, uh, last week, the uh, uh, annual uh, ambassadors conference in Brussels, we have a social media session there. Actually, we had a big session in panel last week uh, with participants, uh, also including a very um, well-known, important uh, journalist uh, based in Brussels, gave some provocative views and, and, and stimulated uh, a very, very good debate among the ambassadors on the use of social media. We use social media to inform, to interact, engage and influence. That was said. When we started in 2011, we started from scratch. There was nothing. There was not, uh, no such thing like EAS Twitter account or Facebook. Nothing. Actually, when I was recruited in 2011 in February, I was the first person to be recruited. And then people followed. And when you have scarce resources and a small budget like we have for communication purposes, and when you have to cover all regions of the world, you have to put your resources there where you can use them most um, efficiently. And that was precisely in social media. So 2011, nothing. And today, for an international organization, we are doing quite well, I have to say. I don't want to brag here. We were <laughs> talking about ranking, uh, about ranking earlier today. But now it so happens that we were recently ranked in the second most influential and most um, uh, actively followed foreign policy institution uh, around the world by, by a research institute. And this we have achieved by engaging and motivating also our staff in delegations and ambassadors to become active on social media platforms. We have the main Twitter account now with 71,300 followers. On our Facebook, we have 60,400 likes. And on our Flickr photo sharing account, 1,800,000 views, which is good. You would say these are modest figures because when you take Obama, when you take the State Department, when you take uh, Carl Bildt, th these figures are less. But again, just think it, uh, what type of organization it is. And this all has been achieved in a very short time with the staffing for social media uh, composed of two persons compared to 200 in State Department. So I think that we were doing pretty well there. So we are reaching out to think tanks and journalists, obviously, the whole foreign policy uh, community. And we used Twitter precisely for statements, photos, videos, and general news. But there's another thing. It is precisely two way. It is, only a good, uh, it is also a good way of finding out what the others are doing. And it's also a way for others, those with whom we are dealing in terms of foreign policy, like for, on Iran talks, our relations with Russia, um, to find out what they are doing. Look, uh, for instance, the uh, Iran, uh, Iranian, uh, the foreign minister of Iran, he has positively changed his image by very good use of his English language Twitter account. The Russian foreign ministry is very active on social media and Twitter. They have a very good English Twitter account and they react rapidly. You might have in your minds the, the joke of the Canadians two weeks ago about the map. Russia, not Russia. Within one hour, the Russian foreign ministry posted, learn your geographics, another. So the, resp the response was there immediately. Then. And I quote to the prominent journalist last week, he said that some of the organizations, bodies, if we can call them adversaries, 
are doing quite well, unfortunately, on social media. Social media can be used by terrorist groups for radicalization of people. We have seen that, mobilizing people. Now, we empower our delegations, we give them guidelines, we give, give them tips and continuous guidance from headquarters. And today, out of our 139 delegations, 90 are actively doing social media. So either they have Facebook accounts or Twitter accounts, and 18 ambassadors are tweeting on, with their own, on their own accounts. We had funny anecdotes today. Funnily, they all relate always to football, the World Cup of football. And it happened precisely to one of our ambassadors as well, who had several mobile devices watching football matches. And then uh, he thought he was tweeting to, to a fellow countryman saying, oh, I'm so ashamed because his um, <laughs> team was performing badly. And so that caused a, a, a small incident. He had to explain then afterwards. But then I give you a good example how a tweet can solve a diplomatic crisis. You remember some time ago when a US diplomat said on a phone call, peep the EU. You remember that? I'm not going to uh, repeat uh, the F word. It happened. It happened. Uh, a couple of days before uh, St. Valentine's Day. So our delegation in Washington, they had the brilliant idea two days before St. Valentine's Day. They tweeted a blue heart and said, I love the EU. That was the tweet. And it was one of the most successful tweets ever for the Washington team. And it was. It was repeated. It was shared. It went, it, uh, it went, went around the world. An important aspect about tweeting is also the language. Iran talks. Our spokesman, <coughs> and we had two spokespersons, Michael Mann, during the Iran talks, he, he uh, tweeted out, and we tweet also in Farsi, not only in English. And instantly, he got 200,000 <coughs> uh, likes, for, uh, followers for that, retweets. So we had successes with tweets on social media, on Iran talks. We tweeted on a me meeting of uh, Catherine Ashton with, with Morsi, a Serbia-Kosovo deal, the Nobel Peace Prize award to, sorry, to the European Union. These were uh, social media successes as an event they expanded. One word about the Facebook. It's a different kind of tool. We use it as well, but it's kind of photo magazine. They, you can share material and put links, uh, links to, to further material that we do and uh, that we would use on our other digital platforms, the website, the main website, and the 139 delegations website that we, that we coordinate as well. So lots of things. That lots of things going there, and we <coughs> we consider it's one of our main main tools. So uh, one word about using it, because now when you talk with ambassadors, some of them say, "Oh yeah, but I have a certain age," and uh, to a Twitter and or Facebook, this is for young people. Then uh, from our perspective, we say, "Okay, uh, the average age at the European External Ac uh, Action Service is 49." So you, what is young and what is old, it is not a question of age. You can learn, so, and then it is not so labor intensive. And obviously you can retweet things. And we, even, we go even countries that have uh, closed platforms, like in V-Contact in, in Russia, Weibo in China, our delegations there are doing a good job. Let me stop there, just uh, leave, for leave some time for the last speaker, and then also for questions and answers. We, of course, we also uh, then uh, try to promote what our delegations do. So we, we, we cross uh, all the activity on social media platforms so that we multiply and we reach out to the largest uh, why this uh, uh, public uh, possible to the audience? So th this is for now, and I'm happy to take questions at the end. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Maria. As you have seen, we have 
been uh, having a quick look at history with uh, Francisco Fonseca and the European Commission, the challenges, the communication programs they also have launched in the, in the last years and, and what our representative does in a, in a member state, Maria, with the, uh, the first steps of the EIS. I was very lucky to, to be part of, of the team. I, in 2010, I was at the European Commission then at the EIS, so I have to pay tribute to, to Maria. I mean, it's incredible the, the job she has done and, and our team. So, and now please, uh, Steve, with some, uh, some words about your experience. We have, the, as I said before, the, the NATO summit, but there is a new unit uh, dealing with public diplomacy at uh, NATO. And uh, I was lucky to attend a seminar, a very, uh, very brilliant one, uh, only some months ago. And you can see that, uh, well, there's a lot of work that has been done and, and many challenges and positive experiences at, at NATO, so please, we are uh, very happy to, to listen to your experience. Thanks. Good, thank you very much. And first, I want to say, Maria, congratulations on your success, and that I agree with all of your points on, on action uh, to initiate social media, so great work. Um, first, uh, uh, thank you very much for this opportunity. Um, I was very encouraged to hear uh, the ambassador's panel this morning, and to hear senior leadership talking about uh, embracing these new ways of communicating and of empowering their staff uh, to also uh, take up these new ways of communicating. Um, you're going to have a much more efficient, effective development uh, of your new media if it comes from the top down. Uh, if it's working from the bottom up, it's generally going to get caught in that bureaucracy in the middle. Uh, and it ends up as a, as a fight between those who want to communicate and those who want control. So when leadership is leading the way, uh, it's going to be a much faster uh, and much more effective uh, implementation uh, for what I call digital outreach. Um, and that is what my section does for NATO. Communication Services leads all of NATO's digital outreach. So my team covers the NATO website, uh, NATO's social media. We have what's called NATO Channel. We have journalists on staff creating content, telling the story of NATO. We have an editorial team creating content, telling the story of NATO. Uh, and we also have the radio and television studio, so doing our broadcast outreach as well. So everything to do with the technology of communications uh, is what my team is doing for NATO. Um, it is interesting to note, this is the third sort of large public diplomacy, public affairs conference uh, that I've attended this year. And all three of them have ended up being primarily discussions about digital outreach. Uh, so that is, you know, that absolutely makes it clear it is the way forward uh, for diplomacy, for public diplomacy, for public affairs, for communications in general. Um, so NATO has had a very interesting ride, uh, to say the least. Um, not that many years ago, uh, there was a very senior NATO official who made the statement that we were operating in the Stone Age when we talk about communications that we had no ability to show what NATO was doing in the field, uh, and we had a very weak presence on the web. That was the Secretary General, Secretary General de Hoopsgeffer. It was a very strong statement from the top. And what he's saying there is, NATO, you are failing at your job to communicate the way the rest of the world is communicating. He was saying, the world is moving forward, and NATO is standing still. Uh, and it was about that time uh, certainly at the with the direction of the Secretary General, that things slowly started to change. Uh, they formed my section, Communication Services, to be focused on uh, creating uh, a digital platforms and doing digital outreach. The challenge was these teams hadn't been told what it is we want to accomplish. They were all very good at what they did. The web team was very good at the web. The TV team was very good at TV. But they hadn't been given an understanding of how they were going to work better together. Um, and that was one of the challenges that I had to address uh, when I got there. Um, so it was very easy when I arrived to see I've got a fantastic team. I'm so fortunate in that I have a team that is excited uh, to be leading a new way of communicating for NATO. They're proud to, to be working for NATO. Uh, and they're honored to be breaking new ground uh, in how NATO is communicating uh, to the world. NATO has a history of slow evolution in communications. To give you an example, in 1995, NATO was still shooting in film. In 1995, NATO was still shooting in film. 
Uh, when I arrived in 2010, shortly after I arrived, we launched a new website. Uh, and I had to be the one to get out there and, and, and promote the new website and be all the cheerleader uh, for NATO's new website. And I had to say, and now we can embed video in our homepage. And in the back of my mind, I'm going, okay, now what I'm saying is we're only five years behind the rest of the world. Uh, but it is progress just the same, uh, and we have to recognize it uh, as such. Um, I was brought in to make change happen for NATO. I was brought in to change how we're communicating to the world, to make a new foundation and to create a new path forward. Uh, the most important aspect of that for NATO um, has been investing in communications technology. They have ignored it for years. Uh, the television, you know, shooting and film in 1995 is an example. The television studio that we had was an example. Uh, they were working with components that were 15 and 20 years old in the television studio. Uh, and the team had been fighting for a very long time to get NATO to understand why the TV studio is important. The reason it got to be in such a poor state was the team was so good at what they did. You know, the VIPs, they come in, they do their events, and they get out. They don't see the TV team running string and tape and tying things together to make it work. So when I walked into uh, the TV studio, one, expecting the best. When I came to NATO, it didn't even occur to me that we would not have the best equipment and the best material to work with. What we had was the exact opposite. Uh, NATO had not invested in their technology. And as an example, in the TV studio, they showed me the audio mixer. And they said, yeah, we're afraid to turn it off because it might not turn back on. <laughs> and, you know, I come in as, you know, the, the noisy American and the, the team in the TV studio is all French. And I said, right there, I said, this is it. I said, we need a new television studio and I'm going to use the audio mixer to get it. And they thought I was absolutely insane. And I went upstairs. I said, imagine this. The secretary general's live on CNN or BBC and his microphone goes dead. Yeah, there's nothing we can do about it. That got their attention. Oh, that's why the TV studio is important. Well, what do you need? We need a new TV studio. And we got it. So I've really learned that practical examples are much more effective in making change happen um, than just espousing the importance of communications and maintaining pace with how the world is communicating and blah, blah, blah. Giving them practical examples of why it's important, why it's ineffective, or how it could lead to real failure uh, is, is a much more effective argumentative approach in that respect. Four years later, uh, I arrived in 2010, four years later, four years later, NATO has made, without a doubt, a quantum leap in how we're communicating to the world. Uh, I give full measure of credit to my team. I am so fortunate to have a team that sees the future uh, for NATO's communications. Uh, they realize that we are the rising trend uh, for NATO's public diplomacy. And NATO's public diplomacy is a three-pillared approach. Uh, my section, communication services, dealing with the technology, managing the tools for outreach. The engagements section, they're doing the more personal approach, organizing events, organizing visit groups, organizing conferences. And then the press and media section, dealing with the professional media. So a three-pillar approach uh, to our public diplomacy outreach. Uh, some of our most recent initiatives, uh, we have, uh, I hope you have all seen, the new NATO website that we just launched last week. Uh, it's now fully mobile compatible, uh, which is pretty important. Uh, and that's one of the points that I wanted to make. I have not heard that discussion yet today. Uh, when you talk about digital outreach, mobile has to be part of your planning. Uh, what we're seeing on an average basis is 20% of visitors to the NATO website are now on mobile devices. Last year, it was 7%. Next year, it could easily be 30 to 40%. During the NATO summit last week, we saw peaks of mobile device access of 40 and 50% on the NATO website. So that is a trend that is growing, and it is something that you must be uh, keeping in mind when you talk about your digital strategy and your digital outreach. Uh, we have a very robust content creation capacity. That's also something I haven't heard in, uh, much conversation about. A lot of conversation about the channels that we're using and the things that we're saying, but content creation is critically important. Uh, you have to have capacity to create quality content. Uh, and that is also a learning process for organizations. Just like you have to learn to integrate digital outreach and digital channels for your communications, you have to learn how to create quality content. Uh, and for NATO, what I have said to, to my bosses, to 
to uh, sort of justify uh, what we're doing and what we've accomplished on our digital outreach is quality content plus dedicated resources has led to definitive results. That is a very simple equation that is very true for NATO. Uh, we're approaching 600,000 followers on Facebook from um, 15,000 uh, in 2011, in January 2011 when we started uh, our, our real focused effort on social media. Uh, we're close to 170,000 followers on Twitter and we have more than 6 million views on YouTube. Now that's not you know, President Obama, Lady Gaga, Justin Bieber numbers, but for NATO, those are good numbers. I can turn to my bosses and say, see, the interest is very high. People want to have a place where they can engage with NATO online, and the potential is huge. But NATO's got to dedicate the resources to it. That is something that I'm fighting very hard. NATO has embraced the idea they haven't dedicated enough resources to doing digital uh, the way we need to be doing it. So resources, also a big part of your discussion uh, when you talk about digital strategy. Um, something that was said earlier, I want to uh, amplify, and, and also uh, one last example, and then I will also uh, uh, turn to the audience. Um, one of the most important messages that I try to deliver uh, when, I, when I do lectures and conferences is, you must be in place first. Be in place first, managing your message, your image, and your perception with these new communication channels. Because if you're not doing it, someone will definitely do it for you. Uh, the NATO Facebook page is a good example. When we were looking in 2010, what were we gonna do for NATO on social media? We found a guy in Denmark, Jens Blauenschild. Uh, he had created on his own time, of his own volition, a NATO fan page on Facebook. And he had about 7,000 followers at that time, which is pretty good. And I said, very interesting. I told my team, I said, reach out to this guy. Maybe there's a partnership to be created there, some sort of a synergy. He can be an external advocate for us, whatever it may be. And he went, you can have it if you want it. I just created it because it wasn't there. So this is a guy on his own time, his own volition, handed NATO the foundation for our social media channels. There are plenty, and fortunately he was working in our best interest. There are plenty of Facebook pages that talks about how much NATO sucks. Uh, so it's not hard to find those. It's much harder to find Facebook pages that illustrate the good things, the good work that NATO is doing. So being in place first is of critical importance, and you maintain a strategic advantage by being in place first. One final point about content. Uh, when you talk about the learning curve of social media, and again, that learning curve of quality content, uh, you need to illustrate to your staff what that means. What does quality content mean? You can't just turn to a staff member and say, give me quality content. Uh, so I've developed a concept that I have really worked to infuse um, into NATO's communication products. It's a concept that I use for myself in many years in television. It simply is communications tangibility. Uh, tangibility by definition is something you, know, you can put your hand on. But in communications, there's also tangibility. If you're showing somebody imagery, pictures and video, that is very strong and it sticks in their head, you've created visual tangibility. You've created a connection with that person. Or if you're showing them a story that's very touching and it hits them in their heart, you've got emotional tangibility. Or if you're giving them information they can take away and use for themselves, or information they can share with other people, people it's informational tangibility. That's the most effective way to connect with an audience. It's an organic connection. People are drawn in at an emotional level uh, and that is mo more likely to maintain that connection because it is organic versus a message line, a media line, a press line. People know a sales pitch when they hear it and they're more resistant and they're more likely to let that pass. But if you draw them in on an emotional level, you're gonna create a much more sustainable connection uh, with your audience. Uh, but the fact is simply, the world is undergoing a paradigm shift in terms of communications. International organizations have to be nimble and flexible and to embrace uh, these new ways of communicating because they are simply going to change how we work, how we live, how we play, how we innovate, how we create, and we communicate forever. And the changes have only begun, so there's much more to come. So, thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Steve. I only want to make, not a wrap-up uh, comment, but uh, I had an, an idea to 
well, to launch a, a question to the three of you, and that's exactly what you mentioned just uh, in your finishing words. I mean, we have been talking all day long about public diplomacy, about the three elements, no? communication, engagement, and also influence, how you can influence. But of course, we also talk about, um, about opinion leaders, about representatives of public opinion in third countries, about citizens. So when we talk about international organizations, by definition, some will say, well, there's a distance between citizens and international organizations. We have been seeing uh, many initiatives in not only in the European world or in NATO, but also at the UN level. And one thing I learned uh, in this seminar in uh, only some months ago in, in NATO is that emotions are something very relevant to take into account when connecting, when communicating, and also when having a feedback, because public diplomacy is uh, something different to have a one-way relation. It's a bilateral relation, at least. You, you need feedback from others. So uh, Steve has explained a little bit about the importance of images, videos, and uh, and the relevance of emotions in, in communication. But I wanted just a very, a very quickly, if you can share with us, uh, Maria, Francisco, and again, maybe Steve, about the challenges and also the success stories of engaging with citizens, uh, either at a European level or at uh, the countries uh, where you are representing an institution. Uh, what are uh, or either reflections or some ideas you can share with us in the uh, in the area of uh, public diplomacy? You were mentioning, for example, the relevance of Flickr in the US uh, new instruments of public diplomacy. And I think these are, uh, these are relevant aspects for our discussion today. Thank you. That uh, clearly you have to be personalized. You have to be personal in, in your tweets as an ambassador, for instance, because if you tweet only speaking points, it's not necessarily interesting to everybody. And you see, clearly, these are speaking points. But if you put something as an ambassador in a third country to reach out to the public there, a personal not, because you tweet in your capacity, an ambassador tweets in his capacity as a person. So it gives a human face. It, is, it makes a difference if an ambassador, for instance, puts out a tweet with the link to the president of the council, Hermann van Rompuy's speech, instead of taking a main message out of it and put it. Anyhow, it's validated. There are no worries. And so because this is also a question that, that our ambassadors ask, so but how can I be sure that I'm not making these mistakes, like so the World Cup mistakes, and so use your common, it's very much about common senses. But then when you give this way the European Union a human face, you can reach out better to the third country citizens, but also those citizens, EU citizens living in third countries. So th that, that is uh, the advice we, we give to, to our ambassadors. Then there's another thing about it that we didn't touch upon that. Well, uh, Stephen, actually, yes, because you have to be timely, so be instant. There, this is a huge advantage of social media. In an organization, European body, like the European External Action Service, that coordinates common positions and issue statements, EU statements, you can imagine how many hours it takes sometimes to have a statement on behalf of the European Union agreed by all the capitals. It takes quite a long time. Sometimes it can take 20 hours, uh, sometimes a little bit less. But there is a difference if we have an, uh, an agreement on ceasefire in Gaza and our spokesman tweets it out. It goes out instantly, and the journalists who follow us, they take it from there. They do not need to wait till the official statement to come out, because there is a part of it is, if you put something about the deal, then it's already in the space there, and, and it, 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 it spreads. So it's instant and powerful in that moment. Francisco, maybe? Well, <laughs> Of course, in my previous intervention, intervention I, I had uh, not talk about uh, the, the social media because I was uh, trying to explain a more general framework. But I fully agree with uh, with Maria the importance of to to manage this uh, 
social media with the characteristics that uh, you, you explained us before. In my opinion, uh, there is a difficult balance between uh, the need to be present in the social media and the capacity to 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 to, to be all the time uh, neglecting the other parts of your work. We have, uh, I think, uh, here in Madrid, we, I have a good team. They they are very active in uh, using my Twitter, my Google, my Facebook, etc., etc., professional account. Uh, for me, it's fundamental to fully trust in your people, because I must confess that uh, the time that I can uh, use myself for the Twitter is not uh, all the day, just to say that I am older than 49 years, you see. <laughs> <laughs> but we have good, uh, we had good, uh, no, 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 frankly speaking, that is not the discussion today, but uh, we are in the 21st century, social media is fundamental, but uh, we, uh, I am a little bit reserved to, 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 to give up uh, the classical ways to communicate with citizens and to all with uh, stakeholders and to have uh, good capacity to arrive at this and another history. Um, we have such stories and no such stories, for example, using social media. Uh, if you are in a campaign, in the social media, with in front of you stakeholders coming from civil society interested in these matters. You have a chance to succeed. For example, last week it was a campaign in Spain coming from the forum call from civil society against the over-regulation of the European Union. We spent the August month in order to Twitter, to, 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 to be in Facebook, to etc., etc., etc. And at the end of the day, I think Miguel is that we, we won. We succeeded because we were able to engage a dialogue, uh, making the difference between the over regulation and the reality. But if you have in front of you stakeholders, not with a uh, interest professional or uh, in a more or less objective way, but they are real activists. I had the impression that we 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 always lose. For example, uh, in July we have a very uh, real deep discussions. It was really tricky concerning the TTIP with Americans. But in front of us, in front of uh, in front of us, we have uh, not uh, civil society, but. Uh, representatives of ideological sectors against capitalism, etc., etc., etc. So, you never win. It's impossible. It's impossible. So, I am older than 14 years. <laughs> <laughs> um, maybe very shortly. Uh, we still have 15 minutes for debate and question and answers, but again, in, in Brussels, I learned in this, in this seminar, uh, there were two main ideas. First, if you, do not, if you do not have Twitter, you do not exist. That was one of the messages. And secondly, the most important factor for the future in public diplomacy is image, how you use image. So maybe if you could uh, develop a little bit. A couple of very quick points on that. Uh, there is a, uh, a gentleman who's a friend of mine. He's a social media consultant in the UK. His name is Ewan Semple. And he wrote a book called, and this is not a promotion, it's just as a good point. Organizations don't tweet, people do. And uh, an example of that is the Secretary General's Facebook page. Now, think about the NATO Secretary General, the important work that he does traveling around the world in you know, major events and major world leaders and, and major international crises. The number one Facebook post of all time on the NATO Secretary General's page was him holding his new grandbaby. Because it was real. People can connect with that. So organizations don't tweet, people do. That's very important to keep in mind. Um, I also think it's an important point to make. We've talked a lot about translation, mostly in, in terms of language. Uh, but it's also important to think about translation of your content for the channels. You wouldn't take a, a press release from your website and just dump it onto your Twitter account. That's not going to work. 
you must translate that content. That goes back to the issue of the quality of content. Um, it's not just about what you want to say, but saying it in the most effective way on which channel. How are you going to say whatever you want to say the most effective way on this channel? It's going to be much different for Facebook than it is for Twitter or Instagram, so on and so forth. Each channel has a different language of its own. And you have to make sure you're adapting your content to meet that. Thank you very much, Steve, and, and all of you. Uh, please, uh, the floor is open for, for questions or comments, please. Or debate as well. <laughs> My name is Sonia Dowsett. I'm a journalist here. So I'm from the other side of the coin. Uh, I work for Reuters here. I had a question. I mean, I'm, I'm on Twitter. I've got followers. You know, but I, I wonder if there's a danger of overplaying the significance of social media in some respects, that we seem to spend all our time tied to the screen. Often at the end of a day, I'll find that I've been so wrapped up in tweeting or, or seeing what people have been saying on the screen rather than going out and meeting people and finding stories. Um, if I'm looking to make a contact, um, I could follow them on Twitter. I could you know, connect through with them through LinkedIn or something like that. It's never as effective as meeting that person in the flesh and blood. Do, do you think that the kind of massive emphasis on social media means that you strip a certain layer of richness from human interaction, which is really what diplomacy is. And I'm just wondering, I mean, I'm, obviously it's incredibly important to keep your online presence there, but we have to do that, you have to temper that with the soft skills of actually meeting people face to face, talking to people face to face, I don't know exactly how that would work in your sphere, in, in the public diplomacy sphere, and I'm interested in just hearing about how you manage to balance those two things. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Please. So I rather uh, <laughs> reply directly to of that, course. because that's very close to my <coughs> heart as well. Yeah. So uh, I said in the beginning of my small speech that um, I had a choice on what to speak, and about what to speak, so I chose social media. But there's a multitude of other things, of course. Social media is complementary on, on that. And indeed, when we do people-to-people -people things, which are the most important things, those things that our delegations carry out in the field, where with the simple or elaborated film festival for children or students, we can reach out in a given country to 40,000 people who come to a real event where the ambassadors go and speak to them, where the delegation staff get engaged uh, with them. That's real. And then we do the little bit of the promotion of it on social uh, media platforms or on our website. So then I didn't mention our press team. Obviously, we have a press team also in strategic communications of the External Action Service, and they have they, uh, the contact all the time. They, they uh, meet the Brussels-based journalists, either on bilateral or in the uh, background briefings, or in the Commission mid, uh, midday press room, phone calls. The contacts are there all the time. The same, our delegations, they organize press visits. They organize with uh, member states ambassadors project visits with local or foreign journalists uh, on the field. So the engaging is happening all the time. There's a very successful public diplomacy initiative uh, by very many delegations, uh, carried out by very many delegations, it's back to school. EU ambassadors go, uh, or EU, sorry, not back to school, that's in, 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 in within the EU. There it's EU comes to your school so that people go and talk to people. Then all the events that delegations organize with the EU information centers, centers of excellency, academic talks, meetings with uh, think tanks, this is, there is a multitude of, of huge uh, vibrating uh, activity taking place all over the place. And we, get, we know about that because we want to promote the things that the delegations are doing. So they inform us and we put it on the net, we put it on the Facebook to give it even more visibility. But on the base, there is the people to people contact. So that is important for us. Maybe if you want to add something, yes. Absolutely. We have a 
we have in, uh, in Spain, we have 49 uh, so-called uh, information centers. They depend, in, I mean, in all around uh, the Spanish territory. It depends of uh, deputations, provincial government, or the universities, or the uh, uh, Chamber of Commerce. And uh, we, one of my obsessions in this human face-to-face -face approach is to have the rep all, these, uh, all these people in in the, in the representation or me in the different territories in order to have all the information to give these, these people the opportunity to answer the questions. We have in this year, in the, between, no, in this, in the first semester, we, has, we have answered more than 15,000 direct questions for citizens controlled by us, by made by this uh, information center. Yeah. Steve? Say you know um, one. I, I agree. You don't want to let uh, let's say social media overtake or override your other channels for communication. Uh, they all have to be maintained with a balance. Uh, what I say to my team because there is this constant fight that the web team wants to be better than the social media team and the TV team wants to get more coverage than than both. And I, what I say to them is that the success of any one of our channels depends on the success of all of our channels. Uh, so you should not overlook any one for another. They all have to be managed uh, with balance, and that includes that personal contact. And I, as I mentioned, the breakdown of our division is media, physical, personal engagement, and technology. Uh, so you're really reaching different audiences with each channel. You know, our digital channels, our digital outreach, is more for a, the broadest of audiences, the people who just want a basic understanding of what NATO is, what we do, to build that awareness. That more personal engagement is going to come in with the key opinion formers and the more specialized audiences. That's where that personal engagement is going to be much more effective. Please. A uh, small invitation, so to get inside what is concretely done in terms of people-to-people -people engagement. On the EAS website, there's a part right up hand side, you have the toolbar EU and the citizens. And you go there and you have a full repertoire of all the Europe Day and Europe Month events that delegations are doing. These are all about engaging with people. So, and then by categories, cultural events, sports events, youth events, you name it. And you will find, so, so you, you can be reassured, this is happening. This is the core business, basically, of, uh, of the uh, delegations, public diplomacy departments, then, with, with the social media, of course. Then. Okay, thank you very much. Maybe some more questions or comments, or yes, Charles, please. Uh, micro. Okay. Panel first. Hi. Good afternoon. Uh, I uh, uh, work with with Ricardo in the public policy department of of the ministry. Um, I wanted to ask uh, our panelists, uh, especially Stephen, who has an experience with uh, traditional media. Uh, what's the interaction and what's the um, the relation? Because I, I would um, I would think that traditional media uh, has uh, more of a knowledge of of how to uh, affect public opinion and how we could use that knowledge in order to to influence our public and and how we could uh, create that that interaction with the knowledge and and the reach of uh, traditional media thank you that's a very good question um you know one i think it's important to point that, that the the principles um whether you call it public diplomacy public affairs strategic communications psyops, so on and so forth, all of these different terms are all still just communications. Um, and I, I think it's easier to soil, boil it down to that and say what you're just doing on social media and what you're doing in broadcast is simply communications. Um, the crossover um, comes, one, from innovation. You know, if you have good people that are savvy about communications and using these technologies, you empower them to find ways for these to cross over. Um, one approach that I have really tried to bring to, to NATO's digital outreach is the approach of um, cohesive, complementary, and cross-promoting. So each channel has its own added value. Um, you, you'll, you'll get something special at the NATO Facebook page that you're not going to get on, say, our Twitter feed or on our YouTube channel. So each audience feels like they're getting a little something special because they're there. 
so the idea of added value is very important, but you want each channel drawing people in, but also pointing to the other channels, going, hey, go check these guys out, because that's important as well. Um, also, you know, traditional media is very much about content creation as well. So using the fundamentals of content creation that is used for television, for example, is going to apply to your website. Um, it's also important to realize that the content that you do create um, ha can be repurposed across multiple platforms by media. Uh, NATO Channel, which is, is, our, is our online news channel, we have, as I said, journalists on staff. It's important to, people, to have people that understand what creating quality content means. That makes such a huge difference. Um, but that content, you know, we use all of that content across our Facebook page and YouTube and on the, on the NATO website. But the ultimate goal, the ultimate purpose of that content is to have it pushed out to be used by traditional media. So we have a very robust distribution platform. So when a NATO channel story is produced, we put it on our distribution system. We have about 1,200 media outlets uh, that receive our content directly. Uh, then we have our distribution partners who have their own networks. So every time a NATO channel story is released, 2,000 media outlets around the world are being notified, hey, there's a new NATO channel story that's available for you. So it is important to be proactive about creating quality content and finding ways to repurpose that and, uh, across multiple channels, not only your own channels, but also media channels as well. Uh, that's where I see the most important crossover because the media is very, very, you know, they're facing austerity. They're losing resources. They have less capacity to get out and get around. They're eager to get content. Um, the key being it has to be quality content. It has to be of use for them, so it needs to be in the right format. It has to be of the right quality. It has to have credibility. Um, but if you can provide content to media outlets, they're very, very receptive to that. Uh, so that's where I think the, the greatest crossover would be. Charles Powell. Thank you. Um, I think we have all witnessed two very interesting public diplomacy battles in the last couple of months. First of all, the Israeli-Palestinian battle uh, in, in Gaza or over Gaza. And secondly, the ongoing Ukrainian conflict. Now, the interesting thing is um, that Israel, with its enormous resources, its uh, very strong support from US public opinion, I would argue, has actually lost the public diplomacy battle, uh, which is an interesting development. Um, because, of course, the great thing about the social media is that others who aren't necessarily invited can also take part. So a lot of third parties, if you like, have taken sides with the Palestinians or at least have qualified um, some of the information that was coming out of Israel. Um, again, I think the Ukraine is an interesting case as well. Um, I, I very much like the NATO Secretary General's Twitter feed. But going back to the point you made that organizations don't tweet, people do, um, this may be a good example of the limits to personal tweeting. In other words, I identify uh, very strongly with what he's been saying, but I don't always feel that that is what NATO is saying, if you see what I mean. His voice has been heard better than NATO's voice. And of course, this is something that you all have in common, and that is that you are all multinational organizations, and therefore, speaking with a single voice, by definition, I is a big challenge. So I was just wondering, in particular, from the External Actual Service and from NATO, uh, what you feel about the, the Ukraine public diplomacy campaign. Of course, it's a tricky one, because Ukraine is not a member of NATO and is not a member of the EU, but we have a lot at stake in, in the Ukraine. Thank you. Right. Um, very briefly, I would say that our team in, in Kiev has um, been living through challenging times because some people would even talk about a propaganda war. True, that is um, a term I haven't chosen it, but uh, we could use it in, in this uh, debate if you, if you wish. And I don't think personally that they are losers, and winners, whatever the propaganda war is, because it's always ongoing. It is something that you can't, you can, okay, I gave the to, to example of the to, to Newland uh, statement about the EU and how it was kindly silenced uh, or the, the positive reaction from the EU side was silenced to, uh, with, with a nice tweet. That is possible, but the, the 
activity on social media platforms is ongoing. There are, there are peak periods, there are slower periods, but it never stops. So I don't know if you ever can choose a moment where you can say that one party has won or lost a propaganda war. So I wouldn't comment further on to that because then that becomes a very, very delicate debate and, and I think that I'm moving on waters there I shouldn't be in. So perhaps NATO would like to comment on sure, that. And, <laughs> I would also keep my comments very brief. Um, you know, it has been um, very interesting to watch how this communications sort of battle has played out. Um, uh, our offices in Kiev and Moscow have also faced pretty significant challenges. Uh, one of the biggest challenges in this communications um, sort of uh, campaign is the resources. Um, you know, the, the, the Russian government has thrown enormous resources into their communications campaign. Uh, and the international organizations don't have as much to work with. That has been the biggest challenge that I've seen. Uh, the other aspect of that is we have to follow more rules than let's say Russia might, or ISIS might have to. Um, you know, they don't have to follow the rules, we do. So our information campaign is much more factually based. Uh, when we identify information that's being released um, that is impacting on NATO, and we can counter that with real facts, that's where we jump in. Uh, so for example, we, you know, we did a, a campaign of, of infographics uh, called uh, Debunking Russian Myths. So we did literally bullet points, and it looked like a scratch pad, line by line. Russia said this, this is the truth. Um, so we face a challenge of resources, and we face a challenge of having to play by the rules a lot more than, than some of our uh, uh, adversaries. Uh, our team in, in, in Kiev produced a Mythbuster in this context as well, and it worked quite well. Yes. Facts. We reply, we, our response is always with facts. We don't get engaged in a propaganda war if it exists. Of course, that is eternal war for me. I am, <laughs> I am not going to, I am just, just one example concerning Ukraine. Uh, well, I, we have uh, here in Madrid a very active uh, campaign in Facebook, in, in, in Twitter, with many people asking us about real concrete questions. What's happened with the cheese? What happens with the fruits? What's happened with the, this kind of produce? Uh, how, uh, how are the, how many help can I have if I give my, my nectarines to, to, to the social, uh, to social restaurants or if I use that for biomass? And we are actively answering people and people and people on these very concrete questions. Nothing about your, overall political mm. design. Okay, thank you so much. We are running out of time. Uh, only one last question from Carmela Barcia. Uh, she works in the office in the Spanish Ministry of Foreign Affairs for planning and analysis. Uh, so thank you very much, Carmela, for your... Thank you. Yes, I just wanted to have your views uh, on the European institutions. I'm not sure if NATO is doing this practice. Uh, many speakers have spoken today about two ways communication the importance of listening, and also about the fact that uh, your audience are citizens, and that's very important from the public sector point of view. I was wondering, from this perspective, and um, the uh, civil society wanting to participate more on, on the side of the policy planning, on the, um, how, from the communications point of view, you see the exercise that the EU institutions do a lot about consultation to citizens before the policy is planned and how you bring together in Brussels or wherever uh, experts, but also interested parties, both uh, on um, presence uh, during events with presence or through the internet. You do all these consultations. Uh, what are your reflections about how that helps the work, both from the communications point of view and the policy, the uh, diplomatic policy, which is not quite diplomatic because it's your citizens. But does that give you some um, uh, tools or baggage for the work you do later in presenting this information? I confess that is uh, one of the points that uh, I am not very happy at all. Well, when I arrived uh, in Madrid, uh, 
to think that it was important to communicate to the citizens, uh, to, 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 to civil actors. There is an important consultation for a green book, for a white book, etc., 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 was completely unknown. Well, uh, I was uh, really engaged to to oblige, not to oblige, to introduce in all our communication channels. Please, uh, I con we consider that the Sp Spaniards don't participate so much in the public consultation. That is five years that I, I am doing that, uh, and I'm a little bit depressed. But I do my best. <laughs> As to public consultations, clearly on diplomacy we do not do public consultations because we are not uh, making laws. This is about legislation. The European Commission very often organises this and they are now, uh, I would say, it's, it's, it's a general habit now that when there's an initiative there's always a consultation online and citizens can contribute. And uh, these reflections are taken into account in a politi uh, policy shaping. So we don't do that. Uh, clearly, because diplomacy it's, it's, a, it, it's a different species in, in, in that case, uh, case, and formulation of foreign policy. We have exchanges with the think tank community and academics and, and uh, foreign ministries, and that's where the, the policy making happens. Um, there are Eurobarometer uh, regular opinion surveys, and they always have this question uh, to role of the EU, how do you perceive the role of the EU as a global actor or something like that. I can't remember the, the, the formulation precisely, but it is an ongoing question. And you might wish to know that we from the EAS, we coordinate the uh, together. We, we chair, I chair uh, personally a platform which is called External Relations Information Committee where we sit together regularly with our counterparts and communication units of, uh, of the EAS sister DGs, of the RELEX family. We sit together and uh, last week, uh, precisely, we had the, the, the brainstorming on global messaging, how we could work together. This is a very timely uh, thing now uh, with the new commission coming. And you saw, perhaps, if you managed to follow any social media accounts today during the seminar there might uh, that uh, for the high representative it was underlined a stronger role or uh, as, as a coordinator for the relics DGs uh, and commissioners so that the closer cooperation in a sense so uh, and that is even more so important in terms of communication so instead of having separate communication strategies, it's, it's good to be together and have some sort of umbrella, perhaps. So these are reflections that are going on and, and we want to see and do that. But the engaging with um, citizens uh, and social media platforms, as you say, organizations do not tweet. Yes, we do. There is, uh, so the ambassadors are the persons and the human face. With the current high representative, it was a deliberate choice that she doesn't have a personal uh, Twitter account, but it's the EAS Twitter account and our spokes have. And therefore, by nature, we do not get as many uh, direct uh, contacts or comments from individuals as a person would get, because it's perhaps uh, more difficult to get engaged in conversation with an organization. But we do get some, and we do reply. Not always. If it's uh, something clearly not nice and provocative and evil, we discard, or we might even, we, we have to monitor also our social media platforms. But we leave also the nasty remarks, we leave them in a public space so that people can express and, and then we accept different views, we accept criticism as well. So, yes, we do engage. Thank you, Thank you very much. Uh, uh, sadly, we have to close this, uh, this panel. We learned a lot this afternoon about history of these institutions here represented, about the challenges they have faced, about the solutions they have been um, coming up with. We have been also listening about the importance of citizens, of human beings, not only tweeting messages, but also having uh, contacts. Uh, information will be also handed over by, by Maria and by the others. And of course, we are all at your disposal. 
And now I want to, uh, to go to the last uh, part of, of this seminar. It is uh, the closing session. Rafael Rubio, in principle, was in charge of the wrapping up of the session, but it will be uh, Juan Luis Manfredi who will uh, do the job because he had a, an unexpected meeting he had to, to attend. Uh, but I will please uh, say to the different moderators of the three panels that if they can join me and uh, a big applause to the panelists. Thank you very much for, for your presence. Thank you, Steve. Thanks.